Welcome to the Rhino Podcast, brought to you by Rhino Records. Interviews with your favorite artists and bands about the songs and albums you love. Here's your host, Rich Mahan. On this episode of the Rhino Podcast, our guest is singer-songwriter and guitarist Ed Robertson of the Bare Naked Ladies, here to talk about the 20th anniversary of their album, Maroon. You walked into the room And the whole place stopped to notice Standing next to you I feel hopeless and you know this I've never been ashamed of my attraction I'd be happy if you gave me just a fraction As we danced Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Rhino Podcast. With us today, we have executive producer John Hughes. John, how are you? I'm good, Rich. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks, John. What's going on in the world of Rhino these days? You know what? I'm really excited with what's up because if you go to rhino.com, you're going to find all sorts of cool things, lots of exclusives. You know, yeah. I, of course, I'm going to sound like a sales guy because I work for the company, but I am really excited about a, a few of the things like the Doors Morrison Hotel 50th Anniversary Deluxe Edition. You got yes. two CDs, one LP. It's freshly remastered by the man, longtime Doors engineer and mixer Bruce Botnick. It's got that's a, right. Yeah, it's got a bonus disc of more than an hour, an hour of unreleased studio outtakes from these so sessions. Cool. So if you're a Doris fan, man, you got to jump on that one. They released one or two songs from this in advance of the record. And I'm telling you, it sounds fantastic. People are going to love this. Yeah, if you want to sample it, I mean, it's on all the streaming services. There's a couple of uh, teaser tracks, and you can see for yourself, you know, that this is a must buy. And, you know, it's not the only thing. There's also Lou Reed, New York, Deluxe Edition, an album that's pretty close to me because it's, you know, I grew up in the 80s. And so New York was really my first Lou Reed record, which is kind of embarrassing to admit yeah. <laughs> to all of them. Well, yeah, for a lot of people, for a lot of people. But, you know, he had kind of like that modern rock moment with Dirty Boulevard and he was being played on MTV 120 minutes. That's how I discovered it. Halloween Parade. Good evening, Mr. Waldheim. There's so many good songs on that record. This deluxe edition, it's three CDs. It's got a DVD. It's got a double LP. And yeah. the Rhino.com exclusive is a cassette bundle. It even has a cassette with it. Uh, so you're getting every single format basically in this box that you could possibly get outside of, you know, a wire recording. Uh, it includes uh, unreleased studio and live tracks, the DVD debut of the New York album concert video. So I can't wait for that. Yeah. The, if you are a Lou Reed fan, this is a must have the New York deluxe edition. Love, love, love that record. In the long line of our replacements reissues, we have the next installment, which is... Pleased to Meet Me, again, probably one of my introductions to a band, and the Pleased to Meet Me was where I came on to the replacements party. It's another Rhino.com exclusive. If you pre-order this, you get replications of the original promo items, including shirts, stickers, tote bags. There's, again, a cassette tape. This is a cool bundle. You got to see it to believe it because this Please to Meet Me Deluxe Edition has got tons of previously unreleased music. And it's kind of sad, but it's also a memoriam for Bob Stinson because this Deluxe Edition has some of Bob's last recordings with the band. So it's really essential. And of course, all the extra stuff that's included. If you go to rhino.com and look at the bundle and see everything you get with it, it really is, man, what a collector's edition. It's killer. So, you yeah. know, the, and the last one sold out. So if you want this, I would not hesitate. It's only at rhino.com. There you go. John, thank you very much. Anytime, Rich. We'll see you next time. Ed Robertson is a founding member of the Bare Naked Ladies, who skyrocketed to national acclaim with their 1998 release Stunt and the number one hit single One Week. Their follow-up platinum album Maroon spawned three top 40 singles and is celebrating its 20th anniversary this year. Ed spoke with us from his studio slash pinball arcade, where he not only writes and records, but also houses his collection of both modern and vintage pinball machines, which he works on himself. Ladies and gentlemen... Ed Robertson. Ed, 
Ed, thanks very much for visiting us here on the Rhino Podcast. Pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. So we're uh, talking mostly today about the 20th anniversary of Maroon, which is the follow-up to your huge worldwide smash, literally, stunt. Prior to stunt, you guys were a successful indie band. You had great traction with some songs like Brian Wilson, If I Had a Million Dollars. And then stunt pushed you into the international spotlight. When you guys were writing and recording Maroon, did you feel any more pressure than you normally did in the studio as a follow-up? It was a bit of both. Like There was pressure to continue the success of stunt, but there was also a little bit of a confidence from stunt where we thought, well, okay. we didn't think stunt was going to be a big hit. And we just made a cool record that we liked. And so it gave us a little bit more confidence in what we were doing. It certainly, there was pressure attached to it. I mean, you know, for the first time, we had a record company all around us, excited, uh, really uh, anticipating what we were going to do. We were kind of under the radar, honestly, until stunned. Uh, Stunt was the first time we really dealt with an A&R department, Sue Drew. We worked with Sue intensively on Stunt. And it felt like for the first time there was a real machine around us. So yeah. there was certainly pressure to keep working at that level, but there was also a lot of uh, kind of liberation in having had the success. What comes to mind when you think about Marin? It remains to this day one of my favorite records. And wow. that's as much because of the songs and the material as it is working with Jim Scott as an engineer and Don was as a producer. It was all about vibes, that record. Um, Jim Scott is a guy that brings as much vibe, literally cases full of vibe as he does cases full of gear. He has cases of blankets and candles and signs and just cool vintage shit that he, first thing he does when he moves in, he lets all the tech set up the gear and he sets up the vibe. And wow, that's so cool. He's great. His list of uh, folks that he's worked for from Tom Petty to Dixie Chicks to, you know, the guy's an absolute legend. And he uh, was such a pleasure to work with all day, every day. So the recording process was, we felt like we knew what we were doing and we were doing it with people that were super cool. You know? Wow, that must have felt great. Yeah, it really felt so great. The record sounds amazing, sonically even on Spotify or the streaming services, it sounds fantastic. Yeah. So you guys had to have been pleased with that. It's a great sounding record. It's also, it's a very adventurous record. It's got some, you know, the poppier stuff like Pinch Me, but then it meanders off into these wild, like, um, the song Tonight is the Night I Fell Asleep at the Wheel, which is this wild yeah. kind of drunken orchestral take. And, uh, I just, I, I think we felt pretty fearless making that record, you know? And again, working with Jim, working with Don, they just encouraged us to follow our instincts. And Jim is a super adventurous uh, engineer. And he, if he wasn't getting the sound he wanted, he would build something to get that sound. He would, you know, harvest parts out of old tape recorders and string them together into these kludge little loop machines that he'd make. And go, oh yeah. Yeah. That's what I want. <laughs> you know? Wow. That's really cool. Yeah. Did you guys feel empowered to be more adventurous and take more risks? Well, I don't know if empowered is right because I think we probably had management and the label going like, we need you to give us that thing again. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever you did last time we need a bit of that again you know um yeah, right but we were working at cello studios um at sunset and gower i think it used to be great western sound maybe it's uh but famous old la studio where 
you know, Sinatra had worked in the Beach Boys and um, yeah. just an absolutely legendary room. Um, so uh, empowered is interesting, though. I think we felt like we had all the tools at our disposal. I, I don't know. Like, Well, there's a lot of energy in that part of town, yeah, too. For me, though. Did you guys eat at Roscoe's Chicken and Waffles? Right across the street. Work at Cello. Try not to gain 15 pounds while you make your record. <laughs> but honestly, I don't know if it's my, my insecurity or my, my Canadian inferiority complex, but I feel like, okay, I'm working with one of the best engineers, one of the best producers in one of the best yeah. rooms in North America. Only I can fuck this up now. <laughs> you know? There's a bit of that, honestly. Like, there's a bit of yeah. like, okay, everything is firing on all cylinders. So I got to rise to the occasion here and deliver. Luckily, I think, like I said, we had some confidence. We, at that point, we were four or five records into our career. So we knew what it was like in a studio. We, I think there was a level of mm -hmm. comfort that offset the pressure. Yeah. Right. Working with Don was, I mean, obviously the guy has this incredible resume. What's his production style like? How does he guide you and, and how does he interject his ideas without derailing the train? Don is very subtle. He really responded to the songs first and foremost. And that should always be the approach, right? Like, he really yeah. honed in yeah. on lyrics, and he, he took me aside in a lot of cases during pre-production and asked me to clarify things. He was saying, are you, are you saying what I think you're saying there? You know, and really zeroing in. He said, he loved Pinch Me, and he said, he, I remember he said, Robertson, you're a brave motherfucker, man. When I was your age, I wasn't going anywhere near this shit. <laughs> this is deep. This is deep shit. And it, it, uh, it really felt good for me to hear this guy, you know, really kind of praising where I was pushing into lyrically. He really responded to it. Because then he would say, you know, when I was working with Dylan, he's, <laughs> you know. And, yeah, right. And then he'd say, well, with Brian Wilson, you know, the thing is, like, and with Don, it's never like, insert big star. It's like, here's a kernel of wisdom that I learned being around this absolute legend, you know? And yeah. Don would drop these pearls on us. And then he'd do funny things. Like when I say subtle, we were working on a track and Don just came in the studio and he just put a, a case down near Jim our bass player. And Jim had been playing upright bass on this song. And uh, he just put it down. And Jim said, oh, oh, what's that? Don said, oh, I just, I, it's a, you know, it's a 62 uh, Fender Precision. I, I got to drop it off for a friend, but um, I got to do that later. So I'm just putting it here. And Jim goes, oh, can I check it out? And Don's like, oh, yeah, yeah, sure, man. Try it out. That's the bass Don wanted Jim to play on that song of course but he came in yeah. stealth he didn't want it to seem like it was his idea you know dude how cool so is he that? did shit like and that then, of course, all the time he wasn't delivering yeah. it to anybody it was there so yeah. it would get played <laughs> right. on the song <laughs> yeah don seems like the kind of guy that would drop a dylan nugget of wisdom on you with as much nonchalance as telling you what kind of sandwich he had for lunch yeah yeah it's funny you say well, what kind of sandwich he had for lunch because Don at the time was doing the zone diet. This is another thing we always joke about from this record. <laughs> so we'd be like ordering from Roscoe's chicken and waffles and Don would have a little plastic container with an apple and a slice of cheddar in it. And he'd be looking, looking around the table. And then we, uh, the funny thing is like, the receptionist would come in and uh, like quietly tell Jim Scott, the engineer, 
oh, John Steak is in the lounge. Like he's telling us he's on the zone. Meanwhile, he's ordering steaks and he's eating them in reception. <laughs> so, so Jim Scott goes on the studio intercom and he goes, John was your steak is in the lobby. <laughs> totally busted him. It was really funny. Sometimes Don would get involved when we would order dinner to the studio. And he'd say, you know, okay, yeah, so get us this and this and this. And you guys, um, you guys want cheese pizza too? Cheese pizza for the table? For the table. For the table. Clearly Don, yeah, Don right. <laughs> on the zone diet wanted a fucking cheese yeah, pizza right. as well. <laughs> Yeah, right. Yeah, 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 yeah. But he wanted us to pay for it and think it was our idea. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. So really good time. Like great, great vibes between everybody. And that encourages good performances, you know? And sure. Absolutely. That kind of relaxed, adventurous environment mixed with the incredible experience in the room. Like we were just kind of coming into our own, I think as a studio band and then add to that, you know, this incredible engineer and producer, it was like the ingredients were all there. Don was pretty involved in the pre-pro. He flew up to Toronto where we were rehearsing, sat in on the rehearsals, wow. made a lot of notes. Um, you know, he's such an intuitive musician himself. He had a lot of great arrangement suggestions. Um, and I think in terms of the approach to the songs, that may have been a lot of Jim Scott's input to what to track with. Are oh, we going to track it on acoustic? Am I singing live? Will I track it? It felt like a real spirit of collaboration. We really did go for band performances it, it wasn't a record that That's was great. built a piece at a time it was like guitar bass drums vocal bed track and we would do yeah. multiple takes and then largely leave it up to jim scott and don to choose what the take was i mean when you have that level of trust in those guys that can say oh we got it you know that was the one and maybe you're in there going, no, 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 let's do one more take. To have those guys go, no, no, that was it. That's yeah. invaluable in the studio. Because you can second guess yourself to death. And you're focusing on the intricacies of your performance. And missing the fact yeah. that the drummer just nailed it. <laughs> you know? So, right, right. So go with that take. Fix what you got to fix and move on. Picking the one with the vibe more often than not translates better for the listener. Totally. And and a lot of times you need you need that sixth beetle outside of the room, you know, listening in the studio yeah, sure. to tell you. And when there's that level of trust, it's it's really great. Well, you guys wrote a lot of songs for this record. You wrote 17 and you pared it down to the 13 if you count the hidden track at the end of the record. Does songwriting come easy to you? Is it something you have to sit down and really, is it a, you know, a, a discipline that you have to really, okay, I've got to sit down and write today? Or does it just flow out of you and you have to catch it before it evaporates? Uh, definitely a bit of both. I have written songs in one sitting where I feel like a lightning rod and like, uh, my God, I must be ripping this off. It's coming, it's coming to me too quickly. Yeah, right. uh, yeah I'm going to get sued for this. Yeah, and then other songs, <laughs> it takes me months to, to finish. Uh, I wish I knew the, the secret, but I, I do really believe in the craft of songwriting. I think you get a lot more inspiration if you take the craft more seriously. And... I, I believe you've got to keep going to the well. And I do force myself to write. And sometimes nothing comes. If, if there's one thing I've gotten good at over the years, it's avoiding writer's block of any sort. And the way I do that is I work on a lot of songs at once. And the moment I get stuck on something, I move on to another song. Like if I'm getting at all frustrated or I can't find the line, or I can't find the melody, boom, I move to another song. Okay. So generally, I have like seven or eight 
songs on the go and they have an emotional center. They have us like, there's a skeleton I'm trying to hang bones on. I kind of know where they're going. I just don't know how I'm going to get there yet. For me, when I like, generally I write music and lyrics at the same time. To me, when I think I have a song, it's when I get a few couplets and a melody. So yeah. even at that early stage, a couple of lines I kind it's like I have my thesis in my head and I, I know where I want it to go. So sometimes once yeah. I have that, I just put that down and I move on. Unless the inspiration is really flowing, I go, okay, I know what that one is now. I'm going to move on. And I'll bang through everything I have going, whether it's six songs, eight songs. I'll just keep going. As soon as I get stuck, I move to the next song. As soon as I get stuck, move to the next song. If I get through all of them and I'm still feeling stuck, I go for a walk or I go, uh, I'm going to take the dogs out, throw the ball for a while, or I'm going to go for a drive. Like, yeah. I really feel sure. like a distracted mind is a creative mind. You have to focus on the craft of writing and give yourself the time to do that. But I feel like the hyper focus is not good. You have right. to apply yourself to the task but allow yourself to be creative and kind of flow freely. And be able to still see the forest. Totally. By literally walking yeah. through the yeah. forest. <laughs> Which you know, is always nice. I, I've written almost every song since Stun up at this lake spot that I'm at right now. Um, I'm very isolated up here. I, I can walk through acres and acres and acres of forest trails and, I sit and look out at this beautiful lake and I have only d the distractions I make for myself up here. So um, right, yeah. it's been really excellent for me. When do you choose to write by yourself? And when do you think in my head, you know what? I ought to co-write this with somebody else. I mean, I co-wrote with Steve Page for 20 years and I, you know, we did, we got so many great songs from that process. I really like the process of collaboration. Generally, I like to have my thesis down before I bring it to somebody. You know, I, I yeah. want to know where the song's going. And, and that can just be, like I said, it can be a guitar hook and a couple of lines, but I already know where it's going. I sort of have a, I can describe it, though I haven't fleshed it out yet. Collaboration is still a process I really enjoy. After parting ways with Steve, I fairly quickly got into a long-term writing partnership with Kevin Griffin from Better Than Ezra. Together, we've written most of the band's singles over the last 10 years. Wow. So it has been a really fun and fruitful writing partnership. When I go to write with other people, I generally don't want to work on my half songs. Like I'm going to them for things I wouldn't have thought of on my own. So I yeah. often show up to a writing session with Kevin Griffin or with Donovan and say like, what do you got? Cause I've already got these 10 ideas that I'm incubating and trying to figure out those uh, ideas. I tend to take within the band. I, if I can't get somewhere, I'll flip it to Kev or to Jim and say, I need a bridge in this. What, where would you go here? And Kev provided me with some killer bridges on the last record. I love the bridges in your songs. Ah. I think that they really pop. You know, and sometimes a bridge is almost an afterthought with a certain song you hear. And you're like, well, that didn't really lift it. But in your case... Your bridges really serve a purpose to refresh the listener in the middle of the song to carry it through so it doesn't get stagnant towards the end. What is your approach to writing bridges? Do you have a formula? Do you have any basic ideas or tenets that you try to stick to? A bridge really has to matter as far as I'm concerned. It's, I, I remember hearing uh, Livingston Taylor talk about writing. He he. I think he teaches songwriting at Berkeley now. He's okay. James Taylor's brother, great songwriter in his own right, had a few hits over the years, really kind of sage writing dude. 
He said, bridges are so important. And as a writer, you get your verses and you get your choruses. And then you think, what? Now I got to write a whole other fucking song? Yeah, you do. <laughs> and and that's, that's what a great bridge is. It's another song in the middle of your song. Wow. It's a new melody. What a cool way to think about it. Yeah, new melody and new chord progression. It's often an alternate point of view. I I treat it as like a different take on where you're going lyrically or a deeper dive, you know, more exploration. But yeah, it's a song within the song. All the great bridges could be their own song. That would be an interesting thing to do, actually, to take some of my favorite bridges and make that the hook of a new song and finish those songs where the bridges become the, the verses of a new song. That'd be a cool project. A bridge over troubled water, it'll be called. <laughs> and each bridge becomes the next song. And the bridge from yeah. that song becomes the next song. Yeah. Yeah. A bridge too far. <laughs> we could go all day with uh, this. Yeah. Bridge over the river. Why the fuck would you do that? (laughs) (laughs) I was just going to bring up that title. That's hilarious. (laughs) Well, you know, a lot of people say that Maroon is a more sophisticated sounding record than Stunt. Do you agree with that? I think it's because people assume we're idiots. And then they hear the record and go, oh, that's the more sophisticated. We've been getting that (laughs) review. Honestly, we've been getting that review since our first record. Um, Have you really? This is a more sophisticated approach by the band. (laughs) And I think we brought that on ourselves because we're so stupid live. We do so much silliness live. There's so much improv, uh, spontaneity, that when people kind of deep dive on the records and, you know, notice the musicianship and the... the effort we put into vocal harmonies and lyrics and stuff. They go, oh, oh, these guys are, uh, these guys are a little more sophisticated this time around. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, it's obvious that you guys are having a good time because it just comes across in the music. And is it true that you guys record one song on each record in the nude? We did that. I want to say up until we, probably turned 40 (laughs) at that point we had seen each other naked so much that it literally caused no difference in the vibe in the room (laughs) okay that was gonna be my next question did you do it because it was a huge vibe changer yeah and you would get a different performance we did it because it was silly and ridiculous and sometimes it would just put this weird energy and it, it would happen like while we were recording, go, oh, fuck, we're not nailing this. It's the naked track. Everybody, let's go. And so <laughs> we'd strip down, and it was funny, and, and you know, it, it was silly, and being in a studio naked is funny. And it would add this <laughs> ridiculous energy to the record. Yeah, I guess there just came a point where it didn't change the energy at all. <laughs> so, so it wasn't <laughs> worth doing. After you've been on yeah, tour right. with guys for two decades, it's like, yeah, I could sculpt his genitalia in clay from memory. I, I don't <laughs> need to ever see them again. <laughs> yeah, the plaster caster visits you backstage. And you're like, no, we're good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll be shy and cab. <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. What was it about the track Hidden Sun? Why did you guys decide to hide that one at the end of the record? I think it was a track that we all really loved and really loved the the sentiment of it. Thought it was a great song by Kev and a great vibey delivery. We felt like it it needed to be near the record but it didn't necessarily hang with the, the body of the record. We wanted it oh, interesting. there. Okay. You know, yeah. it was like we all, it would have not maybe made the cut for the record, but we all loved it. So we wanted it there. And it was sort of a nod to 
how much we loved Kev, how much we loved the song. And it was like in the big record company hit machine, that song may have not made the record. A hidden sun that burns and burns Never does any harm to anyone A hidden sun that burns and burns But never does any Let's talk about some more songs on the record. I've pinched me. We touched on that one. Tell us about that song. It's a very melancholy song. And it's about, it's about grappling with fame. You know, I was a pretty new dad at the time, trying to make sense of those two realities. That kind of waking dream sense that you have when things get so blurry and you're just doing amazing things all the time and yet you're missing amazing things that are happening with your family at home and so there's this sense of loss and longing while also having the best time of your life and traveling all over the world and and meeting fancy people everywhere you go so I was kind of ruminating on that confusion. That was a track that Don really responded to out of the gate. He really liked the lyric and liked where I was going kind of emotionally with it. Sonically and, and kind of the guitar line, I was really inspired by Cheryl Crow, her song Leaving Las Vegas. It has yeah, yeah. that do 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 really simple guitar turnaround that I just thought was super hooky. And I was playing around with that. I put it kind of in a different place, phrased it in the melody in a different place. And the chord structure is different. It just has that same turnaround in it. The way that song sat right on the edge of like a classic rock, Tom Petty approach straight ahead and embraced the kind of modern recording techniques of loops and things. Yeah. That's where I wanted to go with Pinch Me, and it really was like Sheryl Crow was the big inspiration on that, I would say. Like a genie trying to remember when it's gone, then you try to escape, but it only comes out as a arm when you try to see who will be on your front door. Take your time to wait, how long can make you smile when you realize again, my side might take a while just to try to figure out what all this is for. Try to figure out what all this is for. One of the things that I noticed about that song right away, production wise, is that, you know, the first two songs on the album kind of have similar drum tones, but that one has way radically different drum tones. Yeah. Right? The kick drum's filtered. There's a bunch of different stuff about it that really makes it pop and stand out from the tone that the first two songs set. Yeah. We were really trying to embrace some loopy modern elements while we still wanted it to be a song you could play around a campfire. Every song's got to pass the campfire test for me, or it's wow. just production tricks. You know, I don't want the hook of the song to be the production loop or the samples that are in it. It's got to be a melodic hook that you can play on an instrument. That is what's special about the song. Otherwise you just, you're putting lipstick on a pig. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which again, I don't have a problem. Well, sometimes they need a little makeup. <laughs> yeah falling for the first time shimmering is a word that's frequently used to describe this but i really like the contrasting vocal lines you'll say it's sunny but it's cloudy right you get these diametrically opposed couplets yeah how did that help you get across what you wanted to say with this song falling for the first time is about failing it's about failing yourself it's about failing your loved ones it's about it's about admitting to the facade that we all present. I really wanted to say, yes, my life is fucking fantastic. It, it, like, yeah. everything you see here is real. All of this shininess, all of this excitement and happiness, it's all real. But all of the fuck-ups that you don't see are there too, you know? Sure. 
I am a whole person and I have made as many mistakes as everybody else. So falling for the first time is about an exuberance in the release of admitting that you're human. Paul Myers was writing the authorized biography on the band at the time. And he came by, he was an old friend from Toronto, Mike Myers' brother. And we always describe him as Mike Myers' funnier brother. Um, <laughs> is it run in the family? And I think Mike would describe him that way too. Paul is really yeah. hilarious. But he came by the studio and, and we played him falling for the first time. His only commentary was while the song was playing, he did this running in place thing and pretended to swing a microphone and throw it. And it's like, I had never thought of that song as a, a who Roger Daltrey thing. But as yeah, soon right. as he did that, I was like, oh, fuck. That's, it's the perfect parody of the song. It's like, it's a deep cut on <laughs> who's next or something, you know? Uh, That's hilarious. It, he did it immediately, too. And we all fucking laughed our heads off because <laughs> it wasn't what we were going for at all with the song. But once Paul did the running in place thing and the microphone, yeah, right. spin, was like, fuck, you nailed me. <laughs> I'm so I don't know if he has the same mannerisms as his brother, but you know, as soon as you did that running in place thing, I just pictured him and Austin Powers when they're doing that running yeah, in place totally, montage, right? right? Yeah. yeah. And the thing is, I think Mike gets a lot of that from Paul. Paul's the funny older brother, you know? How could he not, right? Yeah. I mean, they shared the same experiences growing up. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Well, we talked about your bridges and too little too late is a great example of one of your bridges that I really like a lot. This one, to me, it just seems to keep climbing until it resolves. I mean, yeah. it doesn't go back down in the core progression. How did you guys achieve that? Because that's not easy to do. Yeah. Yeah, I love that bridge, too. I like the analog references to record and play Yeah. instead of endless rewind. I give a lot of credit to that building process, actually, to, to Jim Creek and our bassist, because... Both he and Kev have a very intense theoretical knowledge. And I'll bet you that bridge was probably a lot more circular when I presented it to him. But Jim has this right. great way of inverting chords and constantly building momentum through his bass playing. That chord is going up. It's, it's simple inversions of the chord that take the root of the note out of the chord and and cause it to escalate and escalate and escalate. And Jim, Jim is amazing at that. Both Jim and Kev will often make suggestions to me where they're like, oh, you know, this isn't changing the chord or anything, but if you make the E the okay. root of that C chord and don't play the low C, you know, it, it'll help it climb in that section. So like, I really count on them for that. Yeah, that's so creative. Yeah, it takes a knowledge of theory that, you know, I've learned so much from those guys over the years, but they still know they've forgotten more than I'll ever know about musical theory. So, yeah, right, um, right. it's really great to have guys like that in the band that can take something and just give it a few informed tweaks to make it more interesting. If you heard my demos, you would hear like, oh, that's a good song, but it's not that interesting. And when Jim and Kev get a hold of it and add this level of sophistication it just really takes it over the top Original influences musically. Rush were huge for me. 
my childhood bedroom wall was all Rush. I learned to play the instrument, to play those songs. My high school band played like 26 Rush songs, I think, you know? Oh, no kidding. Um, wow. So Rush was big. Neil Young was big. Basically, the music of my older brothers is what I was into for the longest time. You know, so it was Rush, Led Zeppelin, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Neil Young. I really came from that traditional rock and prog rock background. And then joining the other guys, you know, Kev and Steve were huge Beatles guys. Ty was yeah. a huge Rolling Stones and, and Led Zeppelin guy. Jim was like swing music and Elvis. And we really kind of allowed all of those influences to just kind of speak freely. A thing that's always been exciting and liberating about our band is from the very first record, it was super diverse. We never felt like we had a wheelhouse we had to sit in, you know? The first record had like from Montuno jazz piano driven songs like Box Set to really folky stuff like Be My Yoko Ono, kind of more rock and stuff like Brian Wilson. So mm -hmm. I think we left ourselves a really wide palette early on so that it enabled us to be really adventurous. Well, that's one of the great things about music, though, is that it's bottomless. You, there's always something new to learn. Yeah. You know, it, it never, you never figure it out. Yeah. I, I love that about it. Another thing I loved on the record, helicopters. One thing that stood out the first time I listened to that and in the chorus, there's a shaker that if you pay attention to it, makes the song sound like there's a helicopter running in the background. There's just something really cool about that that I love. What's that song about? That song is about the access you get as a celebrity to go to places people don't normally get to go. And you're simultaneously daunted by your ability to influence or draw attention to the plight of, you know, whether it's humanitarian concerns or environmental concerns or political concerns, it can be overwhelming. And, and you think, well, fuck, I just wanted to be in a rock band. Like now, yeah, now right. I, I'm an activist all of a sudden. And a lot of people deride musicians for getting involved or getting behind a cause. It's like, I just, you know, I didn't come here for that. Just shut up and sing. It's like, fuck off. <laughs> yeah, like, totally. You know, my literal job is to express my emotions. And then you find out that there's an issue that you can maybe help out with. Helicopters was about juggling the access with being kind of jaded about the results and, you know, being kind of literally helicoptered into a situation and thinking, ah, oh, I've got to mobilize all of my platform to try and make a difference here and then getting daunted and jaded by the like, what the fuck can I do? How can I help here? Like, can I help here? Why am I here? What is happening? Everybody's laughing while I'd be there for And that must feel at times like there's a huge load just dropped on your shoulders. Totally. And so uh, Helicopters is kind of about that. It's about struggling with wanting to do good, not knowing how to. People's suspicions about rock stars trying to save the rainforest. I remember early on people making fun of Sting trying to save the rainforest. And I'm like, Sting is trying to save the rainforest. That's yeah, a good yeah. thing. Like, totally. And I probably, as at the time, I was probably 15. I hadn't given a thought to the rainforest. So it was good that Sting was doing that, you know? Yeah, right. right. And whatever it be, Peter Gabriel uh, with Amnesty International. Like when you're a jaded 40-something journalist, you go, oh, well, 
you know, what the fuck does he think he knows about that? But when you're a 15 year old kid in the suburbs of Toronto and you've never given a thought to international human rights, it's like those things actually made a difference. I read up about Amnesty International. I learned about Stephen Biko because of Peter Gabriel when I was right. 15 or 16, you know? I think music has an incredible reach for things like that. And I think it's bitterness and jaded kind of futility to try to tear those people down when all they're trying to do is help, you know? Yeah. And I think that's yeah. what Helicopters is about. It's about like, wanting to help, not knowing how to help, being overwhelmed by the situation and also being in the middle of a tour and then you get parachuted into a horror show and then whisked out by red carpet. And then, okay, so see, that's why we're asking you to do this thing. Yeah, it's, it's about the confusion of trying to help. Learning on your feet in a lot of respects, because I'm sure there's things that get thrust upon you that you had no clue were coming. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, you guys are working on your 16th album now. Is that correct? 16? You would, you would know better than I would. <laughs> well, that's the number I'm working with. And how are you guys collaborating during the pandemic? Have you got together, socially distanced, or, or are you working electronically? What's going on? We were actually working here at my cottage for five weeks, just when things started to explode in Italy. Um, and they were just starting to happen on the West Coast. We got, I'd say, two-thirds of the way through the record before everything went into lockdown. So we kind of put the record on hold for seven or eight weeks. And then I set up my studio rig here i was working on all my vocal doubles up here and then uh, studios opened in toronto so we got together with quarantine protocols the engineers and everything were all masked when they were close to us it was you know we can't record and sing while we're wearing masks but we did our best to keep everything clean and safe and we got back into the studio for three weeks i guess and polished off everything we wanted to do and wow. we've just great. been we're just in the mixing process now i think i've heard three mixes but it's uh it's exciting i like this record a lot any rough idea of when you're thinking about releasing it maybe as late as next spring i, I don't know if there's a good reason to yeah. put it out before we can yeah. actually get out of, we're a live band and we need to get sure. out on the road and play these songs well, you had a big tour plan this summer with the Gin Blossoms and Toad the Wet Sprocket, which obviously got derailed like everybody else's tour. And now you're going to do it summer yeah. 2021. So I guess that would time perfectly, wouldn't it? You'd be able to go out, play the new songs on the road. That's part of my thinking. And then another part of me goes, well, let's just put it out there because people want to hear it. I want to see it out there. Yeah. But I sure. also don't want it to be old news by the time we hit the road. And I love it so much already that I really want to give it a chance to shine. So I think the smart move might be to hold on to it until we're ready to tour it. Yeah. Are you guys going crazy not being able to play out? What are you doing in your life to replace the, you know, the shows you would normally be playing? Really just trying to stay creative and stay busy. Honestly, like, this is where a lot of my creative outlet is going. I'm, How did you get into pinball machines? I started playing a lot of pinball when we first started touring because I don't drink and I don't smoke. So I was never hanging out at the bar. I was the guy in the corner playing pinball or leaving yeah. the bar entirely to find a coffee shop with a pinball machine. And then in the late 90s, I was actually, eBay was new. This was like 98 or 99. eBay was sure. new. Yeah, right. And I was looking for a birthday present for my wife, and we were both Star Trek The Next Generation fans. And so I searched. Great show. I was looking for, you know, a signed uh, headshot of Brent Spiner or something, you know. And yeah. 
on my feed comes the Star Trek The Next Generation pinball machine. And I honestly, I thought, wait a minute, you can buy a pinball machine? Like, it hadn't occurred to me, you know? Dude, how much was shipping on that thing? It must have been a fortune. It wasn't bad. I bought it. <laughs> I bought it out of Pittsburgh. And I think it cost, I bought, I ended up, I got on the phone with the guy. He goes, Ed from Canada. Are you the Ed from Canada? Are you the dude from Bare Naked Ladies? I go, uh, yeah, I am. And he said, uh, do you want a Twilight Zone too? And so I bought a Star Trek Next Generation and Twilight Zone. It cost me $400 to ship both of them to Toronto. So it was nothing. That was, let me count, I own 37 now and I've sold 64. Whoa. So that was over 100 pinball machines ago. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Do you have a favorite? I, I have many favorites. The new Jurassic Park is the best Ooh. modern machine. And this old Gottlieb 1976 Fast Draw is my favorite electromechanical. If I don't love them, I move them on. Pinball is one of those. Like guitars. It's, it's, I was about to say that. It's, it's one of those rare yeah. hobbies that if you do it right, you won't lose any money. You know? If you right. buy a yeah, good yeah, used sure. instrument, you can play it for years and then sell it what you for what you paid for it, right? And uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, pinball machines are like that. I've never lost a dime. I picked up an old uh, 1974 Gottlieb Sky Jump, a single player oh, wedge head pin. That. So I've been uh, I've been troubleshooting my way through that. And do you work on them these pinball machines yourself? Yeah, yeah. How cool. Yeah, it's I bet you've learned fun. a lot doing it over the years. Yeah, it's super fun. And it's just fun for me to do other things that aren't music all the time, you know? So Sure, absolutely. To, to take an old 70s pin that isn't working and work my way through it, adjust all the relays, adjust the stepper motors, figure out from the schematic what they're supposed to do, and then try and get them working, it's, it's incredibly satisfying. Ed, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us. Really appreciate it. Great conversation. Thank you. Yeah, pleasure to talk to you. And uh, thanks for revisiting Maroon. It was a incredibly special time in the band's career. And like I said, it's it's one of my favorite records we've ever made. Driving home to be with you. The highways divide the cities in view. As usual, I'm almost on time You're the last thing that's on my mind I wish I could tell you the way that I feel But tonight is the night I fell asleep at the wheel Thanks again to Ed Robertson of the Bare Naked Ladies spending some time with us to talk about their album Maroon now celebrating its 20th anniversary. That album has some great crafty songwriting on it. It's definitely worth a listen. Take care out there, folks. Thanks very much for tuning in. Don't forget to listen and subscribe on iTunes so you don't miss the next Rhino podcast. Producer for Rhino Entertainment, John Hughes. Produced for Rhino Entertainment by Rich Mayhem Promotions. All rights reserved.